At this time, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Todd Alford. Todd is Marketing Manager for System Sensor. Todd, take it away. Okay, great. Thanks, David. And I'd like to also mention that with me today is Scott Lang, our R&D manager. In case I get any really challenging questions, I've got uh, good backup here. And Scott was responsible for uh, some of the content of the material. So um, just let you know that he's here. But today's topic is multi-criteria, the future of fire detect detection. For those of you that attended our previous webinar on future detection technology, you will find a repeat of some of that information. But we're covering it again here, pieces of it to provide a basis for our discussion on multi-criteria and multi-sensor detection as our immediate future. With respect to the agenda, we'll start off with a brief history of smoke detection, which will help us understand where the industry is headed in terms of improved fire detection. And then we'll provide some definitions that will guide the remainder of the discussion. And from there, we can move into the case for multi-criteria detection and some different object options for creating such a product. Finally, we'll look at some real examples and applications of multi-criteria detection. So as far as history, let's talk about uh, the fact that for many of us, we've basically lived our entire lives with a smoke alarm or smoke detector over our heads, either in our homes or at our place of work. The use of smoke detection can actually be traced back to early use on board ocean-going vessels. And that's because in the early part of the century, ship traffic was pretty much the only transcontinental means of moving people, goods, and correspondence. So on board those ships, fire detection and prevention were pretty critical. But eventually, the technology was refined and developed to the point where the size, the cost, and the power requirements allowed for smoke detection to start to be deployed virtually anywhere. And you can see some of the kind of historic milestones there on screen. As I said before, smoke detection wasn't always so common. And that's one of the reasons we saw tragedies like the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, the Coconut Grove tragedy. But as you can see, the deaths related to fire have decreased dramatically over the last 30 to 40 years. And that's not solely attributable to smoke detection, because building codes, uh, improved enforcement, the deployment of fire sprinklers and other changes also deserve some of the credit. But there's no question that the implementation of smoke detection has played an important role in these statistics. Before we move on, we, we really need to start with some definitions, and that will help frame today's discussion. So the simplest definition is that of a single sensor detector. And we're all familiar with this product. There's some examples, like we show on screen, either a photoelectric particulate sensing smoke detector or a thermal thermistor based or heat detector. Basically a single sensor looking for one phenomena or aspect of a fire carrying one uh, device listing. And again, really this is the most common uh, type detector you'll see in the marketplace today. Next we have combination smoke detectors. And NFPA in the 2013 edition of the NFPA 72 standard defines combination as follows. A combination detector has two or more sensors combined in a common housing. So in this case, you can have two sensors for the same phenomena, like a combination photoelectric and ion detector, both looking for particulate. Or you can have two sensors where one is for smoke and the other is for heat, as an example, looking for different phenomena. But the sensors, in this case, in the combination detector act independently and there's no mathematical evaluation of the different sensors. You most, you'll also might have multiple listings for these devices. For, for instance, in the example we're showing here, you could have a UL268 listing for the smoke portion and a UL521 listing for the heat detection portion. But once we start combining the information from multiple sensors, we get to multi-criteria detectors. In order to clear up any confusion about these devices, NFPA 72 recently introduced some new definitions to the code. They came in in the 2010 edition, and now if you look at the 2013 edition, you'll see that, the, that a multi-criteria detector basically carries four common elements that are outlined on the screen. The first, no surprise, is that it has multiple sensors. The second, and this is an important distinguishing feature, is that they have to be mathematically evaluated by a microprocessor. So the signals from those sensors have to be combined mathematically in some sort of an algorithm. 
The third element is that they provide a single alarm signal. And then finally, this device should have only one listing. So in the case of a smoke detector, regardless of the number of elements involved or, or sensors involved, we're talking about a UL-268 listing. Now notice that this definition doesn't require either sensor or one of the sensors to be a photo or an ion or a specific particulate sensor. So you could create a carbon monoxide slash heat detector, for example, and that might qualify as a multi-criteria detector per NFPA 72. And then last, it's important to realize that a multi-criteria detector is different from one that may have a CO sensor on board, for example, that's listed separately for CO life safety per UL 2075 or UL 2034. A distinction is made by the NFPA between multi-criteria and multi-sensor detectors. Most of the parameters for multi-criteria and multi-sensor are the same, including the requirement for that mathematical evaluation of the sensors. But in the case of a multi-sensor, the detector is capable of producing an alarm from any one of the sensors independently or in combination. And there's a listing for each sensor type. So again, in using that photoelectric with thermal example, it would be listed to both UL-268 and UL-521, but different than a, multi a combination sensor in that um, in a combination mode, these two sensors are evaluated mathematically via algorithms. That covers the NFPA definitions, but we should also look at UL smoke detector standard, UL-268. At the moment, the UL standard is effectively silent with respect to multi-criteria technology, but there is a task group that is currently working to add those requirements to the standard for multi-criteria as part of the seventh edition, which is being worked on in task group phase right now. If you look at this definition, it will require more than likely that one of the sensors be either a photo or an ion. And then from there, you can add other sensors to complement it. They do still have to be mathematically evaluated, however. So you, you'll notice that this definition is a little bit narrower than the NFPA 72 definition in that it requires a specific sensor as the primary or lead sensor. All right, we're going to take a, just a quick break here and, and uh, offer up a poll question. David, I'll give it to you. Very good. Thank you, Todd. So the first poll question uh, has to do with multi-criteria multi and multi-sensor definitions. And, we're really curious, have you installed devices that would meet that multi-sensor or multi-criteria definition? And really choose all that applies. So if you select no, obviously you wouldn't pick any of the other ones. But if you could, um, go ahead and make a selection, come back to your screen. So maybe it's yes, because it was specified by an engineer on a project you were working on. Uh, yes, maybe you were the specifying influence to prevent nuisance alarms. Uh, yes, after initial installation to prevent nuisance alarms, so this would be almost more of a retrofit application because of a problem area. Or yes, for other reasons. And if you do pick other reasons, we would encourage you to send us a chat note and what those other reasons might be. Maybe it's a specific installation or uh, another example here that, that uh, we'd like to hear about. So go ahead. Uh, we'd love to get 70 80% of you to vote uh, with this. So come back to your screen and go ahead and give us a vote. Uh, Todd, we do have one question that I can answer. They're asking us if a, uh, this presentation will be available uh, later. And yes, we do plan to archive it online at systemsensor.com and uh, under the training tab. And it can be actually be viewed live or downloaded uh, if you want to present it to a group uh, in the time frame that you need. So uh, that's the only question that's posted now. We do encourage questions uh, during the webinar, so go ahead and use that chat feature as well. Uh, for that. All right, we got 78% voted. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and close it, and then we're going to share the results. Each, each poll question will share the results with you so you can see um, how your peers uh, have voted as well. So Todd, it looks like 55% uh, is our largest. Uh, it does add up to more than 100 because there was multiple choice options here, but 55% have indicated no. They haven't installed these, so you're in the right place. You'll learn about them uh, uh, throughout this webinar. And then the next largest two categories, 24% said yes because it was specified by an engineer, or yes, uh, they've specified it uh, to prevent some kind of nuisance facility or nuisance alarms. Uh, no one did put anything in chat, so we do encourage that. Uh, we'll have another chat option here uh, later. So Todd, let me take that down, and we'll get back to your presentation.
Okay, great. Thanks, David. And uh, again, we appreciate the uh, responses from the audience. It, it helps us uh, see if we're on the right track. And based on the fact that many of you haven't installed multi-criteria detectors or haven't had experience with them, hopefully uh, you're picking up some information today that you'll find helpful in the future. So coming back here, it, it would probably be fair to ask, why have manufacturers gone to the trouble of developing these you know, complex devices, multi-criteria, multi-sensor detectors, when it's been proven that single sensor detectors are sufficient to meet the UL standard, and they very effectively detect fires. Well, despite a variety of improvements to things like the optics, the electronic filtering, the quality of the components that we use in today's detectors, issues do still remain. According to one of the most recent studies by the NFPA, false alarms continue to be an issue. In fact, the number of responses increased by 9% since the last study, and that's after the, having leveled off uh, in the previous years. And if you take out malicious acts and other non-system issues, the fact remains nuisance-related alarms are still a concern. So one thing that can be done to lower that number is to develop products that still provide you accurate fire detection, but with less propensity to alarm when they're in the presence of non-fire conditions that just look like smoke. So what do we know about fires that can help us in developing such a detector? Well, we know in general, all fires have some common characteristics. To varying degrees, you have smoke present in a fire, and usually this is one of the early indicators, but there are also many other airborne particles that can look like smoke. Fires also produce heat, some more than others in the early stages. And in addition, a common element in all fires are combustion gases, and one of the most distinguishable ones is carbon monoxide. And then finally, when fully engaged, light is emitted once flames have developed. So the important thing to understand, however, is that different fires produce these different elements in different quantities at different stages in the fire. And that's where the challenge for a single sensor detector comes in. Certainly on a photoelectric detector, we could just dial up the sensitivity, make it even more responsive to something like a very low, reflecti low reflectivity particulate like you would see in an alcohol fire but then you're going to make that device more prone to nuisances from things like dust, steam, and other non-fire particulate. What we need is more information to help discriminate those types of nuisances from a real fire. So let's take a look at a couple of examples that illustrate that point. Here we have an example of six different types of fires, and these happen to be the European test fires. And they're very similar to the ones used to obtain a UL-268 listing for smoke detectors. What this chart shows are the concentrations of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide in these different fires. The red bars are the ones I'd like to focus on. That represents the CO or carbon monoxide production from each type of fire. As you can see, it, it varies greatly by fire type. And so if we look at a couple of them specifically, test fire three, which is a smoldering cotton fire, and that shows a very high concentration of CO. And then we look at test fire six, which is the flaming alcohol fire, you can see that there's very little carbon monoxide evidence. And then just as an aside, you might be wondering, well, why don't you focus on CO2? That looks like it's a pretty distinguishable feature. Well, the biggest reason is because carbon dioxide is pretty commonly present for, present for other reasons, such as breathing and respiration. So in an empty conference room, may initially have a very low level or low concentration of carbon dioxide, but that will become very elevated once the room fills with people for a meeting, whereas carbon monoxide is much less likely to be present in a normal environment or normal situation. Now looking at those same fires again for other products of combustion, in this case we have the ratios of smoke and heat, and the smoke is represented by the blue, which is the white, more reflective particulate, and then that kind of yellow-orange color, that's the darker, less reflective particulate. And then red indicates the heat. So here we see another distinction. That smoldering fire, test fire three, produces significant concentrations of highly detectable particulate. But the alcohol fire, again, stands out in that it's almost pure heat, which by virtue of the fact that it's just a very clean burning fire. So based on this, we know that one size doesn't fit all. But what are the options for responding to the range of fire types and the different products of combustion for each fire? And that brings us to some of the technology options we can deploy in response to this information. The first thing we can do is we can just enhance the performance of the very, very uh, common and, and well-deployed photoelectric smoke detector. 
There are several different techniques that can be used, and the first group of those are electronic techniques. We can use smoothing or filtering, which is a technique where we take the raw signal from the sensor and we alter it electronically so that it doesn't change as rapidly due to short-term phenomena like dust or small insects. We can also deploy dynamic sensitivity, where the detector doesn't have a fixed sensitivity for a response point, but is actually allowed to adjust and change according to changing environmental conditions. Then there's drift compensation, and that's when we electronically automatically adjust or compensate for the natural dust buildup within the sensing chamber that we know is going to occur over time. And this helps maintain the detector's base sensitivity and not drift toward a more nuisance or alarm prone type situation. And then finally, there's cooperative detection in which you can have, through the communication with the fire alarm panel, more than one detector used to make an alarm decision. Many of these techniques, they've been around for a number of years, but some manufacturers still don't use some or all of them. Then there's the opportunity to look at different light sources of other wavelengths. And we'll talk more about that in a second, but um, you can also use multiple scattering angles, which is basic, basically either two light sources or two different receivers at different angles of the same light source. And that can give you more information about the size of the particles. And of course, you could combine any or all these approaches in a single detector. So you could have a chamber with a single light source that is something different than the typical 880 nanometer infrared light source that most photos use today, and have multiple scattering angles of that source, and then include some of the electronic filtering techniques. All that's perfectly feasible. Another way the performance of photoelectric detectors can be changed is using the light source of a different wavelength, like I said on the previous slide. And with the trend of lighting efficiency driving LED makers to innovate and really allows us to capitalize on these new devices, because we have LEDs today that are much brighter, they're more efficient, and they're cheaper than they've ever been. And one of the key enhancements in this area or in this realm has been blue LEDs. If we went back just a few years ago, we wouldn't have been able to get a blue LED that had the power output that would allow us to really use it effectively in a photoelectric smoke detector. But we have that now today. And we're even able to get LEDs in the UVA range, which is at an even finer wavelength, down around 380 nanometers. So a question you might ask is, well, what's the benefit or the, the uh, performance enhancement from a shorter wavelength of light? And um, I like this analogy. You could view it in terms of using a ruler with finer increments. If you're trying to measure a grain of sand, you wouldn't break out your yardstick. And the same holds true here. Anytime you can get that wavelength of light closer to the actual particle size you're trying to measure, you get better forward scattering of the light off that particle. And that enables you to get better detection of the smaller particles, such as you might see in a cleaner or uh, small particulate fire like a, a flaming fire. We talked a little bit about scattering and uh, using multiple scattering angles. As you might imagine, when light hits a, a particle of smoke, the light reflects off that particle in a number of different directions. Well, when the particle diameter is close to the wavelength of light that's hitting it, it scatters more of that light in the forward direction, like we have shown in the graphic here. If you measure the light at more than one angle, you can take the ratio of those angles, and that ratio will change as the size of the particle changes. Here's what it might look like in a smoke chamber design. So it gives you some information about the size of the particle when you use this technique. And while that's more information and it is useful, it's not necessarily sufficient to discriminate all nuisance concerns. And one good example is cotton wick smoke. That and steam actually produce very similar ratios. So that kind of summarizes the capabilities of particle detection. And you can see that the options are numerous, but we still run into some limitations, which is why we look at other detection enhancement techniques. And let's take a brief look at some of those. If we look at the different fire signatures, we can see there are different technologies or detection techniques we can deploy. If you look at the, I'm not going to read through everything on the screen, but you can see um, there's just a wide variety of options. And we've already talked about smoke and the use of optical particle detections for that aspect of a fire. But as we saw from the test fire graphs, there are gases produced in fires that can help us with detection. And without getting into the details of the different gas detection, detection techniques right now, you can see from the list they're numerous. In addition, there's energy released in a fire. In other words, the heat and the light. 
and actually even acoustics. Fires actually produce an acoustic signature that we can detect. But let's look at a couple of these in more detail. Before we do that, I want to talk about some of the design aspects that we as smoke detector designers have to consider when we're adding sensors to create a multi-criteria or multi-sensor device. The first is that the added sensor, it has to provide new or different information from the base sensor, which in many cases is likely to be a photoelectric sensor. Secondly, that added sensor needs to satisfy a number of parameters. It needs to be selective. For instance, in the case of adding something like a gas sensor, it needs to detect the particular gas we want without also detecting a host of other gases that might be commonly present for non-fire reasons. The added sensor needs to be small in size, as most building owners really prefer the smoke detector to be as small and unob unobtrusive as possible. And probably there's no surprise, it has to be low in cost. But low power consumption is also important for us. Even on the system side, where we're not as dependent on a 9-volt battery or an onboard battery powering the device, those systems still require power supplies and battery backup. So to remain competitive, we can't push our customers or our end users into larger power supplies and more battery backup because that adds cost to the system. And then finally, per people prefer not to have to frequently replace devices or take responsibility for some sort of regular calibration once the devices are installed. An important point, though, is that the added performance from that we get from additional sensors really depends mostly on how those signals from the different sensors are combined using those algorithms. In fact, if you were to take the exact same set of sensors and give it to two different manufacturers, you would likely get two very different detectors as an output with very different performance characteristics. And that's kind of the secret sauce within the industry of how we, how we set ourselves apart and how we differentiate our products. The first added technology I'll share is a heat sensor. And this is one of the most common additions to a particle sensor, and they've been in use for decades. They do meet the majority of the design characteristics we just mentioned. They're low cost. They're small. They consume very little power, and they have a very long life. And most importantly, they provide some additional information that we can use. We'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. But another added benefit of heat detection is that it can be used to both complement the particle sensing but also provide a unique signal for heat detection separately. Now let's take a look at a common gas sensor. What I'm showing here is an electrochemical carbon monoxide sensor, and I chose this one for a variety of reasons. First, it meets many of the design parameters. It's low power, reasonably small, uh, reasonably low in cost, and again, it adds information that we can use. But why this particular technology? Well, as we saw before, carbon monoxide is a pretty common fire gas, and it's unlikely to be present for non-fire conditions. So we can use this sensor to tell us that the particulate we're seeing is probably fire-related when there's CO present, but if there's particulate present without CO, like shower steam, for example, the lack of carbon monoxide can actually help us determine that it's probably not related to a fire. The other added benefit of a CO sensor is it can help us when CO levels become elevated when fire is not present. Carbon monoxide is quickly becoming recognized as a serious risk to life safety, and we've probably all seen news reports of carbon monoxide poisoning from improper venting and, and so forth that have happened in various places throughout the country. Known as the silent killer, com carbon monoxide, it's colorless, it's odorless, it's tasteless. But when fossil fuel burning devices like a gas furnace, a hot water heater, or other types of appliances, or even automobiles are present in the environment, and there's inadequate ventilation or venting, those CO levels can build to a point where they deprive, deprive the brain of oxygen. And what might start out feeling just like uh, some nausea or a headache can lead to life-threatening levels of poison to the bloodstream. I should mention there are other means for detecting carbon monoxide, but the electrochemical means has proven the most reliable and stable for the cost and power required to implement it. Now, one drawback is that these electrochemical sensors have a, a limited life, roughly five to six years, but the cell manufacturers are, are working toward longer life cells, getting us into maybe the more expected or desirable 10-year range. And that's probably coming in the next, next few years. Here's just a quick example of how the addition of a CO sensor can support overall fire detection. What we're showing here is a smoldering 
polyurethane fire, which is a relatively long duration fire, about, about an hour as that uh, smoke uh, develops and the particulate develops prior to full ignition of fire. And this mimics the situation where maybe you've dropped a cigarette on a sofa cushion. And during that test, there's a sizable increase in CO, which we can easily detect. And again, in the absence of CO, we have an excellent nuisance alarm filter. Something like theatrical smoke could be registered as a nuisance since there's no CO component to it. So with that information as a background, let's take a look at some multi-criteria and multi-sensor detection solutions and how they've been applied. This first example is a basic multi-criteria sensor using photoelectric and particul for particulate sensing and heat sensing. This is a product we manufacture called Acclimate, and it's one that meets both the NFPA and the UL definitions of multi-criteria in that it has two sensing elements mathematically combined, one of which being a particulate sensor. But technically, by the NFPA definition, this is actually a multi-sensor detector because it is listed and produces an alarm signal or capable of producing an alarm signal from, from each sensor. And it's listed to both the UL-268 and the UL-521 heat standard. But for simplicity, I'm just going to refer to it generically as a multi-criteria. An added feature of the mathematical evaluation on this product is that we can use the information from those sensors not only to respond differently to different fire conditions, but we can also monitor the changing environment and adjust the response sensitivity set points accordingly. Some applications for a product like this could be dormitories, because there's often a suite type arrangement with an adjoining bathroom that could produce shower steam. It's also very common to have some basic cooking or microwave happening in a dorm room, and the same could be said of a hotel. Office spaces are another possibility. If we look at a typical conference room, it would be ideal to have a detector that is fairly sensitive during off hours or other times when the room's not in use, but then become less sensitive when the room is occupied and there are people present to detect a fire. A multi multi-criteria product like Acclimate can provide that level of self-adjustment. Again, for the same reasons as dormitories and hotels, assisted living centers are a good candidate for a product like this as they have very similar environments. And to that I'd add the fact that nuisance alarms in an assisted living center can actually be more problematic just due to the health and the mobility of the occupants of such a facility. Finally, higher traffic areas where the environment changes regularly from high activity to periods of low activity, that's another good candidate for a self-adjusting product like this. Other areas, though, like entryways and indoor-outdoor type spaces are less ideal, as that rapid change of temperature that can occur every time doors are opened could create an undesirable response. So let's look graphically at an example of this type of technology in action. This goes back a number of years when internally here we were doing some testing on the product in our own facility. We were monitoring the sensitivity of the detector over the course of a weekend. And when we came back the following Monday to analyze the data, there was a bit of a surprise in there. So the graph showing here starts at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. And you can see as it transitions from a period of greater to a greater sensitivity as the sensor inputs determine lower activity level in the building. As 4 o'clock on a Friday, people are departing for the weekend, and the building's becoming less occupied. And that's kind of stage one on the graph there. And then later that evening, the sensitivity adjusts again as the result of the nightly cleaning crew coming in and doing their work, and that's stage two in the graph. But the real surprise was the spike in the sensitivity setting, or, or actually moving to a less sensitive setting, um, over the weekend that we didn't anticipate. It wasn't until we spoke to our facility manager the following week that we learned that an annual floor buffing had been scheduled for that weekend, and they had come through and stirred up a lot of uh, particulate. And you can see that a fixed single sensor like a photoelectric, standard photoelectric smoke detector likely would have alarmed and, and exceeded its set point during that situation. But again, a self-adjusting, intelligent product using the algorithms built into it is able to avoid an alarm situation in a non-fire event such as this. And at this point, we'll take another break for a poll question, so I'll give it back over to you, David. All right. Very good, Todd. Thank you. So the next poll question relates to what we've been talking about, specifically applications uh, for a product like Acclimate. So we're really asking about the where here. So do you have applications for a product like Acclimate and where? So please come back to your screen if you could. 
uh, click no if you don't think you anticipate any applications. Uh, maybe in that lodging, dormitory, sleeping space uh, that Todd's mentioned here in, in one of his examples. Uh, maybe apartment buildings, high traffic areas, or problem areas in any building. And if you do pick that last one, we'd love you to send us a chat and just indicate what problem areas that you might be uh, referring to. Todd, you might be interested to know, uh, we did have a couple answers float in, um, a couple chat answers float in after our last poll question. And they were saying that they had used a multi-sensor uh, detector in uh, an unoccupied storage area. Uh, and they really felt for the little additional cost, they had both smoke and heat detection coverage. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, it's a good example or a good application. Yep, and then they also, another one came in that said that they had in, involved, installed the combo detector in, uh, for heat and smoke in dormitory rooms, which I think is a great example as well. Yeah, and that's one of the most common applications for combination smoke and heat. Yep, yep. Uh, we did have one question that came in, um, and while people are answering the poll question here, I'd love to love you have you explain it. Um, they, they want a, a, a better definition or maybe a reminder of what multi-criteria means versus multi-sensor. Okay. Um, really, they're, they're very similar, and it's, it's only NFPA that makes that distinction, but you know, so in both cases, multi-criteria, multi-sensor, you have obviously more than one sensor involved, and they're both, the signals from those sensors are combined and mathematically evaluated, but by the NFPA definition, a multi-criteria detector has only one listing, so it's, it's in most cases, it's generally just a smoke detector listed to UL-268. It just has a lot of sensor inputs to determine whether this is a you know, smoke or fire condition. In a multi-sensor detector, by the NFPA definition, you can actually have um, responses from multiple sensors. They, they can still be combined mathematically and help make the fire decision, but you can also have, you know, let's say, the, the heat sensor on there also listed to UL-521 just for heat uh, response. And in the communication with the fire alarm panel, the detector can provide data that tells the fire alarm panel this was the reason for the alarm, and it, you know, it was a heat-related alarm, not a smoke or fire-related alarm. And the panel can interpret, interpret that data and provide a, a unique signal based on that information. So it, it's a really minor distinction, but uh, it's one that NFPA makes and, and one I thought we should cover. OK, good. I am sharing the poll results. We had uh, about 75% of the people that did vote. So Todd, it looks like uh, only 18% uh, didn't see any applications in their current work for a product like Acclimate. And then, uh, as you guessed, uh, or as you know, uh, the, the largest single area, 56% are indicating that that lodging, dormitory, and sleeping space uh, would be very applicable. And then also high traffic areas at 37%. And what's interesting is a few, a few folks, actually, thank you for contributing to the chat as well. Uh, we asked the question, what problem areas in your building? And they're saying um, they've used multi-criteria detectors in hospital patient rooms, uh, wastewater treatment uh, facilities, uh, electrical rooms, um, break rooms and office spaces can be a problem because of microwaves and toasters, uh, a haunted house, fun house. Lots of fake smoke and steam was present. And uh, BEQ building, not sure what that means, maybe you know. But such things as laundry, TV, game room. Um, and they're actually asking us a question on that one. Uh, what do you think about a thought? Actually, it's a question, I'm sorry. <laughs> they, they're asking, what do you think about a thoughts of using it in a, a multi-purpose area, uh, such as a laundry space or a TV game room uh, space? Um, certainly, the, the Acclimate product or a, a you know combination photo heat with the uh, automatic sensitivity adjustment uh, could be a good application or a good uh, product for that application. Uh, I'm going to talk next about a, another product or another deployment of multi-sensor, multi-criteria detection that might even be more suited to, especially like the laundry room example. So somebody's getting a little ahead of me there, but that's okay. We'll uh, we'll get through that in the next session. Maybe this will help answer the question. Very good. All right, so I took the poll question down, so back to you, Todd. OK. So what we're showing here is a more recent example of how multi-criteria detection can be accomplished. It's probably no surprise I'm using one of our own products, but it's one, I've, one I use because it does a really nice job of illustrating that balance of looking at all the available technologies and considerations for ideal complementary sensors to a photoelectric sensor. So the advanced multi-criteria detector that you see here, 
It's really designed to provide a, a best of both worlds situation. It's very, very robust in, return, in terms of rejecting nuisance conditions, but at the same time, it doesn't force one to sacrifice on accurate response to true fire. So let's walk through the different elements of the detector first. And we start with just traditional photoelectric smoke sensing combined with electronic heat sensors. So that's not unlike the Acclimate product that we just covered. But in addition, we add infrared light sensing and carbon monoxide gas sensing. And the CO sensor in this product has the capability of being there not only to contribute to the fire alarm decision, but also separately monitoring CO levels for life-threatening levels of CO by itself. And then finally, as, with, as is true with any multi-criteria detector, we use onboard intelligence to process those signals and separate nuisance conditions from real fire. Applications for this level of multi-criteria detector would include some of the same living areas we discussed previously, as well as high-value asset situations like museums or record storage. You could also include high-value operations, such as a stock trading facility, and then I would also add things like medical facilities. Um, given just the costs and the risks associated with interrupting the type of activities that pl take place in a medical facility, either you know, surgeries, um, discoveries, and tests going on that they don't want to interrupt for something that is a not, truly a non-fire condition. And then some of the more unique examples would be things like nightclubs, performance theaters, where they're using artificial smoke to enhance the overall ambiance of the performance. And then there are unique areas in manufacturing facilities that could apply. And then finally, some of the more specialized areas within hospitals make good applications for technology such as this. And let's actually look at some specific case study examples of each. This first one is that nightclub scenario. And I've got two examples here. And the first, both of them involving synthetic smoke. But this first is uh, a nightclub called the Rumba Room, which it's part of the Universal City Walk property in Hollywood, California, where on the dance floor they were bringing in that theater smoke, and they'd actually tried a number of different theater smoke technologies from different vendors, telling them, you know, put this in. It, it uses a different type of chemistry. It's not going to cause problems for your smoke detectors. And invariably, a month in or so, they'd start having to evacuate the club on a nightly basis. And the real drawback here is because of the way the City Walk properties are structured, the buildings are very interconnected, so when they would have a nuisance condition, they would have to not only evacuate the nightclub, but also some of the associated uh, facilities adjacent to it, like the restaurant below it and nearby properties. So it became a very costly disruption of business for Universal City Walk to the point where they, they actually said, we want you to bypass the smoke detection in that area and put it on supervisory only so that we don't have to keep coming out here and giving the all clear. And they're able to do that because they act as their own fire marshal. But in the process of upgrading the fire alarm systems at this facility, the engineered system distributor said, hey, you know, there's this new technology out, new detection technology. Why don't we try it here? And they deployed them just kind of in that dance floor area. And they've been operating now in, back into full alarm mode, not the supervisory fire watch mode since July of 2009 without a single false alarm situation from the uh, synthetic smoke. Similarly, the Excel nightclub, which is part of a, a new hotel in New York City, right in the uh, Times Square Health Kitchen area. It's a brand new hotel, and it's you know very similar application to the Rumber Room. This nightclub on the main floor actually brought in that, you know, was using that synthetic smoke on their opening night, they had an evacuation and put about 1,100 people out into the street while they cleared the facility and determined it was just related to synthetic smoke. So they, on their you know, premier opening night, they, they had an evacuation. The engineered system distributor came in there, looked at the situation, and recommended the use of um, you know, more sophisticated multi-criteria detection in there. They've been, open, or they've been operating now without a problem ever since. And that just happened uh, middle to late last year. So this is a relatively recent scenario. And let's stay on that, that, that same hotel, the Out Hotel in New York. Again, I said it's a, a brand new high profile boutique style motel or hotel in New York City. And because of the codes and standards in, in the city of New York, carbon monoxide detection was required in all of the sleeping spaces. And in this case, that meant 110 unique rooms, some of them multi-room suites. The benefit to having carbon monoxide and smoke detection in a single device is that it saves significant labor and time for the installing contractor 
versus putting in separate devices. And for the property owner, just having an improved aesthetic by consolidating the number of devices that have to be sitting on the wall or on the ceiling of the, of the facility, putting them all into a single unit. And then finally, you know, the typical nuisance alarm potential from showers, microwaves, and other activities that you might see in a hotel application really lent itself to the multi-criteria nature of the detector. I mean, you certainly don't want to be the hotel owner who evacuates all their guests into such a populous area like they had to do at the nightclub. This is not good for their reputation. So um, the deployment of multi-criteria detection combined with the carbon monoxide capability really worked well in this scenario. This next one is a theater example. This is the Egyptian theater, which is a 1,400 person or seat theater in DeKalb, Illinois. It was built in 1929, kind of during the height of the excitement around the discovery of King Tut's tomb in Egypt. And at that time, a number of Egyptian-themed theaters, restaurants, that sort of thing were constructed in the US, but only a few of them remain. And this particular property is on the National Registry of Historic Places. They put on all sorts of performances here, including your traditional musicals and stage plays, but they also bring in classical music productions, rock concerts, and in some cases, they're using that theater smoke as part of the performance. And this is an older building without air conditioning, so often they leave the front doors open, and open, which can pull smoke off the stage, that theater smoke, off the stage and into other parts of the building. And that was creating frequent problems for their older conventional fire alarm system and detectors to the point where they had to bypass the system and deploy a fire watch during performances. They, because of the historic nature of the facility, they were fortunate enough to get a grant to perform some major renovations and they used some of that to upgrade their fire system. And they took the opportunity to put in addressable multi-criteria detection in all the common areas, the stage, and the dressing rooms with enough reserve system capacity to later expand coverage to the full facility. The benefits to having a nuisance immune multi-criteria detector are realized at this facility every year as they run an annual haunted house, which is something uh, one of the uh, chat questions came in and talked about. According to the executive director at the Egyptian, they, use, they pump in so much of that theater smoke that when they open those front doors, the smoke comes pouring out into the street. But despite that, they've now been through two seasons with the detectors installed, and they haven't had a single nuisance alarm issue. I mentioned manufacturing and industrial facilities as another potential application for multi-criteria detection, and this is one such example. This is a, a million square foot facility where within the facility they do some uh, testing of refrigeration or refrigerant compressors, and they manufacture at the facilities those compressors for residential, industrial, and commercial air conditioning systems. So a very huge facility, and the, the testing that they do is so rigorous that it's not uncommon for those refrigerant lines to burst on occasion. And what would happen in the past is they would, uh, that refrigerant burst would set a little cloud of steam up into the air, and the smoke detectors would respond accordingly, but you know, the single criteria smoke detectors would respond and they would be evacuating this million square foot facility. The authorities in charge didn't feel it was appropriate to put those on supervisory um, due to the operations at the facility, so every time they had a situation they had to evacuate. Uh, again, the alarm contractor came in and said, let's try this new technology, and they've been so happy with it that what they've done now is they allow that if a standard photoelectric smoke detector just deployed in that area detects the situation. They do now treat that as a supervisory condition, and they send somebody out to investigate before they evacuate the facility. So a huge savings for them in terms of man manufacturing capacity and, and uptime. But if one of the multi-criteria detectors generates alarm or goes into alarm, then they do evacuate the facility because they have enough confidence that if that device tells us there's an alarm, it truly is a fire condition. And that, again, just helps them keep uninterrupted operation and really protects the employee's safety by not having them evacuate and, and the types of things that happen when people might be in a bit of a panic mode. The last two examples I'll share are some very unique hospital facility implementations. And this first is from a Kaiser Foundation hospital in, uh, it was a construction project in LA City. It was an existing hotel, but they were renovating a major section of the interior of the hospital, and they had to have some sort of fire protection during the construction. The recommendation, or ordinarily, their only choice would have been to pay for a dedicated fire watch. But the fire alarm contractor suggested 
setting up a small single loop panel just during the construction with 50 of the advanced multi-criteria detectors and 15 horn strobes. They ran this way for about 15 months during all the demolition and construction, and all they did was they increased the frequency of cleaning and maintenance of the detectors. During that entire time, they only had two incidents. One was a situation where there was a welder working about a foot away from the detector, which we should detect. That's a true, truly a fire condition. The other was a pallet of drywall that was dropped and stirred up a bunch of dirt and debris, apparently at a time when one of the detectors was you know, close to uh, uh, fully obscured. But otherwise, a very successful test, and as a result of that, setting up a temporary system like that is now recommended by LA City for uh, in place of Firewatch on many construction sites. Another challenging area you can encounter in a hospital environment are the equipment sterilization rooms. What often happens is the hospital employees will open those machines before the cycle is fully complete, and that creates a real problem for standard detection because that they open that lid or the, that canister, the steam goes up and hits that photoelectric smoke detector, ionization smoke detector, and creates a nuisance alarm condition. So again, at a, another Kaiser Foundation hospital, the issue was solved by replacing the standard detectors with advanced multi-criteria, and they operate fine in that environment. So I think we're on to our last poll question. I turn it back to you, David. Very good, Todd. We do have a couple questions here, too. So we'll do the poll question, uh, and then uh, ask at least one of them, and then we'll follow up with any final questions we have towards the end of the presentation. Uh, so the next poll, poll question is, what percentage of the time do you experience situations like those shown in these case studies? So I know many of you uh, haven't had experience yet with uh, multi-criteria, multi-sensor detectors. Uh, so I guess just thinking about the applications that you've worked on, let's say the last 12 months, or maybe you're currently working on, uh, when are you experiencing situations like this? So you see the range of uh, percentages there, so go ahead and click that. Uh, Todd, the first question that's uh, come in uh, while they're voting here is, uh, do multi-criteria detectors, uh, basically the question is, can they set them in the field? Uh, can they set the algorithms in the field for specific applications or possible nuisances that may vary to a specific space? Okay. Um, the answer to that is yes and no. A, a lot of that is really dependent on the interaction between the detector itself and the fire alarm panel. In the case of the, the both products I just described, uh, our OEM panel partners who work with these products, they do have different settings that can be chosen in the panel um, as in order to define kind of the baseline performance and setting of the detector. But most of the algorithm and, and the combination of those different sensors actually takes place on board on the microprocessor in the smoke detector itself and then sends the kind of the composite signal or the, um, you know, the go-no-go no go decision back to the fire alarm panel based on just kind of the baseline setting that's been specified in the programming of the panel. Okay. Hopefully that, that helps answer that. Okay. Uh, good. And just while you go ahead and vote, and then we'll answer any other questions here at the end. But uh, the next question that comes in is, uh, it re relates to your CO, uh, the, the, uh, bar, the bar chart that you had on CO. And they were right. indicating if, if all fires present some level of CO, why isn't there a CO-only fire detector? Um, it's, uh, that's a fair question. Some fires are, are less prone to produce carbon monoxide. If you look at, the uh, again, that alcohol fire, there wasn't a lot of CO present in it, and there are certainly better ways to pick up uh, a, a fire such as that. And, and really, to, to get a UL-268 listing or in Europe to get an EN-54 listing for your detector, you have to be responsive to, to a broad range of fire types, not just specific ones. So um, carbon monoxide as a standalone probably isn't sufficient to respond in the time frame uh, required by those tests. Maybe eventually it would. Even a, in an alcohol fire, there's probably some level of carbon monoxide produced. But at the early stages and in the time frame you would need to meet the, the requirements of the standards, you probably wouldn't be able to successfully pass that test without help from some additional sensors. And that's where, you know, the, the particulate sensors actually, they do very well. They, they, uh, they see particulate from all fire types to some degree or another. It's just we can make them so much more efficient and so much more uh, accurate and nuisance immune by combining sensor elements. Okay. 
All right, I went ahead and posted the poll result questions. Todd, looks like about 58% are in that 0 to 10% range of experiencing situations like that. Ironically, that's close to the 55% that hadn't used um, multi-criteria or multi-sensor technologies. Next largest category was at 11 to 25%. So we do have a couple other questions posted, but we'll, we'll host those at the end of the webinar. So Todd, back to you. Okay, great. So by now, hopefully, you'll agree that there are many possible combinations of sensors. And depending on which sensors are selected, how those signals are combined, the detector's performance will vary. But most likely, each manufacturer is going to have a variety of detectors from which to choose depending on the application. Single criteria smoke detectors actually work very well in many applications, and that fits with the kind of the results of the poll question. In most cases, the very you know, well-deployed photoelectric smoke detector works well in, say, 95% of the situations. But multi-criteria and multi-sensor detectors just broaden the types of applications and the number of applications that can be addressed with a single product. Any serious manufacturer really has to have an array of solutions, whether that's photoelectric, multi-criteria, even high sensitivity, which you know, could be spot detection or high sensitivity aspiration detection. So that pretty much wraps up the material I wanted to cover today. But to summarize, during the presentation, we showed that there is a number of technologies today that we can develop, use to develop a robust multi-criteria detector. And we saw how some of those te technologies have been deployed in the marketplace. Remember, the largest improvement really results from careful sensor selection and combinations, and then the thorough algorithm development to properly combine those signals. And ultimately, we as manufacturers have the responsibility to, to balance the desired performance characteristics with that added cost to achieve those, those performance benefits. OK, and there's some information on the screen. I'll, I'll give it back to you, David. All right, very good. So there is Todd's contact information. If you do have a question you want to ask him directly, email is a great uh, resource for that. And then also, if you're interested in any of the technologies presented uh, by Todd today that are specific to System Sensor, um, you can go to systemsensor.com forward slash multi on our website, and you'll see a collection of those. Todd, we do have five or six questions posted here, so let me just uh, ask them to you in the order received. Um, the first question is about testing and um, inspection of multi-criteria detectors. How is that done? That's a great question. I can generally speak to, to our product, but I think it's fairly similar to most others. Um, we do often get asked about, you know, how do you test a device like this? We set up our devices in such a way that um, a magnet test or, or holding a magnet up to the device puts it in a mode where um, certainly it, it tests the electronics of the device, makes sure that communication to the panel is working effectively, and that all the downstream actions you expect to happen when the device goes into alarm are working. You know, the NAC turns on, fan motors shut down, all that great stuff. But in terms of testing the performance of the detector, the other thing that magnet test does is it temporarily puts the detector in what we call speed up mode or bypass mode. It, it, it essentially turns off the algorithms and allows you to you know, hit that detector with canned smoke, just like it was a standalone photoelectric smoke detector so you can show that smoke entry response is effective. Now some HJs are fine with that and NFPA 72 actually is fine with that in their definition of testing of a multi-criteria or multi-sensor detector. However, if for some reason a, an HJ wanted to see an actual multi-criteria response, there are some third-party manufacturers that make uh, test devices that will allow you to introduce both carbon monoxide, heat, smoke, in different combinations, in different order, so that you could actually test that device without bypassing the algorithms and showing how, in a true multi-phenomena uh, event, the device would respond. So there's a couple ways to, to go about it. All right, very good. Uh, next question is, they have an application for gas detectors, gas leakage detectors, for an industrial facility, and they're wondering if a multi-criteria detector could be used in replace of those gas detectors? It's really probably not the best application. I mean, th these detectors that I'm describing are really designed to be fire detectors, with the exception that the ones with a carbon monoxide sensor included with them do have that ability. They've been very specifically set up for carbon monoxide. 
and to respond to the, the thresholds and set points that NFPA 720 for carbon monoxide detection demand. Um, to use them in an industrial environment to monitor other types of uh, gases present, you're really better off going with an industrial gas detection solution, which can be tied back in many cases to your fire alarm panel and monitored through the fire alarm panel using a, um, a special communications module that will translate the 4 to 20 milliamp outputs, for instance, from a industrial gas sensor and then share that information back to the fire alarm panel so that you can monitor that in, that information in a single place. But using a multi-criteria detector for industrial gas detection, typical gas detection solutions probably isn't recommended. Okay. All right. Uh, the next uh, attendee is asking, he's aware of multi-criteria detectors for addressable panels. What about conventional units? What's available? Um, you know, we operate in the, the addressable world. We do make some conventional devices, but really it's in the addressable world where we've deployed the multi-criteria, multi-sensor technologies. I don't, off the top of my head, know of a manufacturer producing a conventional device that um, is a true multi-criteria, you know, algorithm, mathematically evaluated device. It, it probably does exist out there, but it's not something that, uh, that we produce, for example. It, it truly is for the, uh, the addressable connected world. Okay. Should be quick to point out that uh, at the ISC West show, which is April uh, 2013, so just a few weeks away, uh, we will be launching our I-4 combination uh, smoke CO detector. Uh, which is designed for conventional panels. Um, so I guess, Todd, the, the, might be the question, uh, multi-criteria within smoke CO or uh, in that conventional unit, is that a true definition of that, or is that a multi-sensor unit, or how would that fit? The I-4 product that we'll be showing at ISC West, that would be described as a combination sensor. So it's listed for both carbon monoxide detection as well as smoke detection, but there's no mathematical evaluation. They're not using the CO information to help make a fire decision, for instance. It's really like having a carbon monoxide sensor or detector and a photoelectric detector just in the same housing. Okay. All right. And just for the people who might be using conventional uh, products, that, that product should be launched by the end of April 2013. Um, uh, Todd, next question. Uh, do any of these units ha come with built-in sounders? Um, none of the ones I've described come with a built-in sounder, and again, that, that usually tends to be more in the conventional realm, a UL217 listed product. However, uh, in the case of the advanced multi-criteria detector I showed that, that has the carbon monoxide output, uh, there is a specific uh, addressable sounder base that, that really works very well in conjunction with that product and capable of, in a local event or a general evacuation event, producing the appropriate tone. So for fire, the temporal three tone, and in the case of a CO event, um, the temporal four, that fast four beep tone. And that's all based on the detector communicating to the fire alarm panel saying the reason I've gone into alarm is for fire or CO. The fire alarm panel taking that information and then activating that sounder base by address and saying sounder base number 53, for instance, your detector says there's a CO event. You need to turn on and you need to produce a temporal four tone. So um, using a, a separate sounder base is, is the way we've deployed it on the intelligent products, not okay. integral. All right. Uh, last question. We're just at the end of our hour here. So last question that's posted is, uh, would, would multi-sensor devices work with any addressable panel? Unfortunately, no. Um, there are unique communication protocols for essentially every intelligent fire alarm control panel. And we have to design our product for the fire alarm panel partners that we work with such that it is listed and designed to work specifically with their protocol. So you can't generically deploy these on, on anybody's panel. And if you're interested in uh, panel manufacturers that you know, support these products, the ones we've described here, um, I would encourage anybody to just send me an email. I don't, I don't want to turn this into a sales pitch. Just send me an email and I can uh, give you some more detail on, on the options available. Very good. Uh, that does bring us to the conclusion of our webinar. On behalf of System Sensor, I want to thank you for joining us today. As a follow-up, we will send you a brief survey in about an hour and would appreciate your help in filling that out. And we will reward one of you that completes the survey with a $50 Amazon gift card. Thank you for joining us. This does conclude our webinar. Have a nice rest of the day.